Well, good afternoon and welcome to GPA Live. I'm your host, Ron Aaron Eisenberg. And every Saturday, we bring you information, very special guests, and a very special program designed to help folks and their loved ones dealing with chronic pain. GPA Live is a virtual education series produced by the Global Pain Association. Today's topic, what can I help my foot pain with? How do we deal with foot pain? What are the answers to foot pain? Our special guest, Dr. James Ogden with Alamo Podiatry Associates who will be with us in a couple of moments. But first I wanna tell you a little bit about the Global Pain Association. What is it? Well, it's an organization that is in business as a nonprofit to help people living with pain by improving their quality of life through education, resources, and providing a community in which they can identify and help solve mutual problems. GPA Live is one of those resources, and it's the newly formed, as is the newly formed GPA Warriors Support Group. The support group meets the first and third Tuesdays of the month via Zoom from 7 to 8 p.m. And if you are someone who's struggling with chronic pain, go to globalpain.org and you can sign up for the support group. It's no cost. It's all free. Uh, but you can uh, hang out with folks struggling with similar issues. Go to the website, globalpain.org, to learn more and uh, get the Zoom login for the support group. Now, I want to take just a moment and uh, introduce our special guest today. Dr. James Ogden is a podiatrist. He's in private practice since 1985, board certified, a graduate of the Ohio College of Podiatric Medicine. His residency was at UT Health Science Center right here in San Antonio. And Dr. Ogden, welcome to GPA Live. It's, it's great well, seeing you. Good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me. Now, for those who uh, in general know that a podiatrist deal with issues of the foot, uh, tell us a little bit about what they are, what you are, and, and what the education is. Sure. Um, usually a college graduate degree uh, is necessary, uh, followed by uh, podiatry school, which is four years. Uh, upon graduation, most uh, uh, graduates are entering into a residency of anywhere from one to three years, uh, depending on their um, desire as far as the surgical uh, levels that they can go to. Most podiatrists are trained in, in the foot alone, uh, but uh, the podiatrists these days uh, that do three-year programs are very uh, well-trained in ankle surgery as well. Uh, and as a podiatrist, uh, your focus is feet, and very often you work hand-in-hand -hand with primary care providers, do you not? Very much so, because a lot of uh, foot conditions can be related to systemic problems, um, and uh, particularly uh, nerve conditions and circulation conditions, we have to rely on the other specialists to help us out. Now, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but for those who wonder, uh, what are the typical foot ailments that are most common? Uh, what we see most commonly is a, a lot of heel pain. Uh, there's a lot of uh, problems in the balls of the feet as well based on foot structure and or footwear and activities. <clears throat> uh, sometimes the posterior uh, to the heel area, the Achilles tendon can get uh, aggravated uh, quite easily with activities and or uh, uh, wearing, wearing flats or, or barefooting too often. Now we have a slide on that talks about plantar fascia, Morton's neuroma, osteoarthritis, and tarsal tunnel syndrome. What are those? Yes, those are all inflammatory conditions that occur in the feet, and uh, they're relatively commonly seen in podiatry offices. A lot of them are related, again, to uh, foot type uh, and activity level, and uh, shoe wear has become a very important issue. Now, you also have a picture of an ingrown toenail, which I get all the time. Yes. on the big toe on my left foot. What makes that happen? 
Yes, uh, a lot of times uh, there's two concepts that we see. Either the nail is uh, deeply uh, ingrowing on either side where it pinches in the skin quite a bit, or in some cases the nail plate itself is just too wide for the toe and it becomes difficult to keep it trimmed comfortably. Uh, a lot of ingrown nails uh, occur when people are trying to do some home surgery and uh, they tend to leave a little uh, like spur of nail stuck down on the side that's a little too deep for them to get at. And then over time, it pokes into the skin and creates an infection. And you mentioned a little home surgery. My guess is you'd rather folks went to their podiatrist. Yeah, it, it, it solves a lot of problems because the um, uh, it's very hard to work on yourself uh, uh, from the standpoint of being able to reach it and see it clearly. And uh, particularly if there's any uh, history of diabetes or circulation problems, it, it can sometimes create a devastating result. Now, you've also got a picture of bunions. My late grandma Tamarkin had bunions. This is in the 1940s and 50s. Bunions so large that my mom and her uh, other sisters would literally carve holes in grandma's shoes so the bunion could hang out. That's correct. And it's still done today for some people. What is a bunion? A bunion is a, a growth that uh, de develops in the uh, first metatarsal. Uh, the uh, metatarsal tends to splay out. The foot gets wider. As the foot sp splays out, the toes tend to draw in towards one another, where the big toe starts to go towards the second toe. And uh, you develop an actual bony bump on the uh, outside of the big toe uh, of the first metatarsal. And uh, that creates pain and pressure in the shoes. That's what that knot uh, that you see that uh, is on the side of the foot, that's, that's bone tissue usually. And how do you treat it? Conservatively, it's very, you know, for a while you can treat it with wider shoes or cutting shoes and, and people who are not surgical candidates. But uh, the majority of time it's a surgical intervention uh, where the area is opened up, the bump is shaved off. Normally the metatarsal bone has to be cut uh, and moved back into an, a straighter position. And it's usually pinned with a, a screw or a plate. And then the big toe uh, upon loosening ligaments and tendons can be straightened out to where you have a, a more aligned uh, big toe. And then one more before we move on, corns and calluses. How do yes. those differ from bunions? Yeah, normally the bunion is the bony uh, prominence. Corns and calluses are really the same thing. We call corns that occur on top of the toes or between the toes, and calluses are known to be on the bottom of the foot, like in the ball of the foot or, or even at the tips of the toes. Um, those are usually the result of deformities that occur in the feet over time. Uh, a lot of the forefoot deformities that we see such as bunions and hammer toes are hereditary they just run in the family and then over time shoes and activities can irritate them and a hammer toe is a hammer toe is when the smaller toes start to draw up or contract and uh, they start to develop an arthritic change in the knuckles over many years initially they're usually fairly flexible and they don't really form corns, but uh, as they get a little stiffer over time, um, then the uh, shoe irritation increases and that's when the corns develop. If you've just joined us, we're talking with podiatrist, Dr. James Ogden, talking about issues involving the foot. And if you are with us on Facebook, please share us. When you share this program, more folks are able to benefit from the educational basis of what we're doing. So share, share, share. And we thank you for that. Those of you in the chat box, go ahead and share us, please. So, Dr. Ogden, we have on screen a, a picture of a foot from the calf on down. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you treat foot pain. Sure. <clears throat> uh, most foot pain that we see normally uh, has been a uh, uh, occurring for a time period before people will come in. You know, they'll, they'll wait and see if it's gonna go away or they'll try some home remedies to try and make it go away. <clears throat> so a lot of the problems we see kind of get a head start 
most of them are inflammatory conditions, uh, strained ligaments, strained tendons. Uh, <clears throat> there are uh, just inflammatory uh, conditions that occur based on the foot structure and uh, activity level. A lot of times these are overuse injuries where people are uh, working out too intensely or they're increasing their mileage and running too quickly and they just uh, put the foot at a stress point where it can't quite handle it. Now my wife for a period of time had pain every time she stepped down on her foot it seemed to be something wrong uh, with her heel. Uh, ultimately it resolved itself I'm not sure why but is heel pain pretty common? Heel pain is probably the most common thing that's seen in podiatry offices. And the majority of it, probably 95% of it, is a condition called plantar fasciitis. Uh, it's uh, also called heel spur syndrome. Uh, and uh, uh, people often associate a little bone spur on the heel that develops on the uh, bottom portion of the uh, heel bone. And uh, we know that from our standpoint that the heel spur is not the cause of the pain, it's the plantar fascia ligament. The, the plantar fascia ligament runs from the ball of the foot all the way down the arch and attaches all across the bottom of the heel. And uh, in cases where we've had to do MRIs on the uh, condition, we find that the ligament is very inflamed, but rarely is the bone ever involved. Plantar fasciitis, when it's occurring, when it's developing, often starts out intermittently, where you'll have good days and bad days. Uh, the classic symptoms of plantar fascia, plantar fasciitis, is uh, uh, pain with first steps in the morning or after rest, uh, and then it tends to calm down. But over, as the day progresses, if you're very active on the feet, it does become a bit more sensitive. And I know when he was time, uh, it becomes more persistently and more intensely painful. When Tim Duncan was playing basketball, uh, occasionally they'd say uh, he was struggling with plantar fasciitis. I can't imagine running the length of the court uh, with pain in your foot, especially at his weight and, right. and uh, intensity level. Yeah. And, you know, running, jumping activities when you have that problem can uh, really uh, create a lot more uh, inflammation and discomfort. And it's a, particularly in high level athletes like that, it's a very difficult problem because the, the best treatment for them is, is for the most part, sitting them down. Now in the uh, professional world, of course, they're getting the, the best physical therapy available, which uh, oftentimes allows them to recover more quickly. But um, even lay persons who want to be active, uh, it, it can be quite debilitating because they're trying to do things to lose weight or to get in shape and then their feet are not allowing them to uh, to pursue that because it's breaking down. We live in a community where so many people have diabetes, uh, leading the nation in the incidence of type 2 diabetes, uh, often associated with something called peripheral neuropathy. Yes. What is that? Peripheral neuropathy is a condition where there is damage done to the uh, nerve fibers uh, in, in the extremities. It often starts in the feet, usually at the toe level. And uh, what we'll see is people will start to complain of either a tingling, burning sensation, or sometimes just numbness. Uh, what happens is the uh, uh, diabetes, we don't know the complete mechanism of action, how it occurs, but the diabetes over time seems to cause damage to the nerves, whether it's in the vascular flow, two of them, or just the damage to the nerve itself. And over time, uh, peripheral neuropathy is a progressive problem. Uh, it, it will kind of spread into the foot uh, and, and, and can occur even all the way up to the knees. The problem with peripheral neuropathy is it's a, um, we don't have a cure for it. There are medications to take to control the uh, symptoms of it, uh, such as the pain and burning. But uh, the best treatment seems to be, in, in, uh, when it's related to diabetes, is controlling the sugar levels. Uh, but any diabetic over time is going to develop some degree of neuropathy. Some people it may take many years to develop, other people, Oftentimes, we're diagnosed as diabetic once we treated their feet because we found that they were uh, desensate. They didn't have feeling in their feet. We send them over to their internist, and they find out that they're diabetic. 
So it's a, it's a problem that's very difficult to treat. There's a lot of research being done on it. And uh, we continue to see new treatment types come out, but we still haven't found anything that we can hang our hat on to say that this will help it. Now, I have a friend who uh, has diabetes for a period of time. Uh, he simply ignored it, uh, developed peripheral neuropathy, and suffered a wound on the bottom of his foot. He cut it in a swimming pool. Didn't know he had cut it because he had no feeling of pain. Uh, the, the end of that story is uh, he had to have uh, his leg below the knee amputated uh, because of uh, an infection that spread through the bone that he wasn't aware he had. Correct. Part of the devastating process of uh, peripheral neuropathy and diabetes in general uh, is that the diabetes also affects the circulation to the extremities, particularly the, the feet. Uh, because they're furthest away from the heart. The large vessels in the upper leg and lower leg tend to get calcified or clogged up, and then the foot's not receiving proper uh, circulation. So it's something that we can sometimes catch early and have the vascular uh, surgeons go in and, and open up some of those vessels. But uh, a lot of times in conjunction with neuropathy where they have no feeling, it, if it doesn't hurt, they don't respond to it. And uh, some of these normal calluses that we would see turn into sores because the callus gets so thick that it breaks down underneath and forms an abscess. Or like your uh, illustration, they, they, they get a cut on the foot and uh, doesn't bother them, so they don't worry about it. And you know, within a few days, they develop an infection. And in his case, it was disastrous. Yeah, it, it, it's... it's it happens frequently. It's something that we spend a lot of time uh, uh, educating our diabetic patients. Uh, those kind of events don't have to happen um, if they will get on top of their diabetes and, and take control of, of what's going on with their life. Now, I, I know that uh, it's a sad statistic, but Texas leads the nation in the number of foot amputations. Yes. It's a big part of our practice, my training here at the uh, Health Science Center. That was primarily what we were seeing, and that's been a big part of my practice for the last 35 years. The, um, the amputations occur because the disease process takes its toll. Uh, even in some situations where people take very good care of their diabetes, there's still the pr uh, aging process and uh, the development of circulation issues that sometimes can be fixed, sometimes they cannot be fixed. And in those situations where they, they can't improve the circulation flow to the foot, the foot's at some point in time going to get an insult, whether it's an ingrown toenail or a, a callus that breaks down or a puncture wound. Uh, some event like that oftentimes creates this devastating effect that where they have to come up below the knee uh, because that's the only area that will properly heal. And now these days, the prosthetics are much more, are, are built a lot better so people can uh, get back to a normal lifestyle much more quickly. Uh, we do partial amputations uh, in, uh, in the feet to, a, to about the midfoot level, around this level here. If you try to amputate further back, it doesn't give you a functional limb and it usually breaks down in the long run. So. Sometimes people question us, you know, hey, my big toe's infected and turned black. Why am I losing my leg? It's because the blood flow from the knee down has gotten so severely clogged and it's something that can't be fixed that they have to come up at that level. About footwear, uh, because as it turns out on our chat box, I see it's almost all women uh, and high heels uh, are, are an issue uh, years ago, more and more women wore the four-inch, five-inch high heels, uh, which I know, Dr. Ogden, not good for the feet. No, it, you know, it tends to put the foot in an awkward uh, position where it stresses the, four, uh, uh, the uh, ball of foot area and the toes greatly. Um, it, it puts the joints uh, under undue uh, pressure and forces uh, that can cause breakdowns. We normally are encouraging women, particularly women who have to uh, wear dress shoes to work, to stay in that one to two inch range uh, heel height for work days. And then if they want to go dress up at night and wear some real nice high heels, then that's okay because they won't be in them for extended hours. But when the foot is 
place in a abnormal position for an extended period of time, uh, it can start to create problems. Now on screen, we have a picture of an insert uh, as an example of something else you can do to help your feet. That is correct. We use a lot of inserts, uh, different kinds for different problems, uh, primarily orthotics, which are more uh, uh, molded in, uh, insole or, or molded components that we make uh, to fit in shoes. They, they fit well in athletic shoes, and a lot of times that's where they're most necessary. Uh, people who have very flexible, flat feet oftentimes would benefit from having more support because it helps hold the arch in a more neutral, normal position, which takes a lot of strain off the foot and the joints. Uh, and then in high arched uh, feet, a lot of times we're using more cushioned components because they have a real stiff uh, arch and they need more shock absorbing, uh, shock absorbing uh, and uh, uh, cushioning relief. If we made you king for a day, what shoe would you mandate men and women wear? Well, what we're primarily trying to look for is a, uh, a, a most of the athletic shoes are, are built pretty well. There's, there's, there's several brands that are built just a little bit better, but generally what we're looking for is a shoe that has some structure to it. In the last few years, a lot of the uh, athletic shoes and casual uh, uh, wear have come out with these really lightweight, ultra lightweight shoes, which is nice for not having a heavy shoe to drag around, but it provides little or no support uh, to, the, to the feet. So a good shoe would have a little bit of a lift to the heel, uh, has a, a firm uh, heel counter, meaning in the, in the uh, heel area, the, the shoe should have some firmness around this area. It shouldn't be real squishy. And uh, they usually have a removable insole, which has some arch support built into it. The insoles that come with most shoes, even the elite running shoes, are probably good for about three or four months, and then they get compressed. But we prefer shoes that have these removable insoles so you can just turn around and, and put in a replacement insole, which can be found at most of the uh, shoe uh, running shoe stores uh, and uh, at um, uh, sports stores, sports equipment stores. Now, we're not looking for endorsements, but I know uh, Dr. Scholes uh, has displays in most stores uh, which feature inserts. Uh, do you recommend them? And how do you know which insert you should buy for yourself? Correct. Yes. Uh, the Dr. Scholes, uh, they're okay. You know, they're, they're a decent insert. I think they, they uh, like a lot of the uh, products, they get overpriced a lot of times because they are not custom devices. They are, um, you know, just made basically from, from size to size. And they don't really specify is it best for a flat foot or is it best for a high arch foot. They have the uh, little pressure pads that people step on and tells you where you're putting the most pressure. Uh, but the, the uh, most of the devices are beneficial, but there are some that are just better than others. And then in some situations when those type of devices aren't uh, functioning well enough, causing uh, relief of the discomfort, that's where the custom orthotics that podiatrists make uh, often come in handy. You know, somebody asked in our chat box, where do you go for the inserts? And the answer is your podiatrist. Yeah, usually the podiatry does most of them. There are a few, um, stores uh, uh, out uh, that do inserts as well. Uh, again, we don't usually like those too much because they're still pulling something off the shelf. It's not a custom device. If you want a custom device, you should see a podiatrist. And how do you find one? Podiatrists are pretty readily available. The, the, you know, they're, um, I think in San Antonio here, we probably have about uh, 50 or 60 of them. Um, the you know, you just got to get online. Most of them have uh, websites and, and uh, uh, good old yellow pages. Anything we haven't asked you that uh, you want to toss in? Yeah, there's a, 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 the area of the ball of foot is another area that we see a lot of problems. And two particular uh, causes of pain in that area are, uh, one is an aroma, which is a pinched nerve process that occurs in the ball of foot. Usually the nerves 
uh, run underneath the ball of foot in between the metatarsals and then they go into each of the toes and people will, will come in more more women than men uh, come in with a burning stabbing pain in the ball of foot that sometimes radiates into the toes and sometimes the toes will contract or spread uh, and that's because the pressure of the nerve uh, swelling is causing more pressure on the other structures. Wow. The other thing that we see very commonly is on the uh, bottom of the ball of the foot, the metatarsal bones here can sometimes become very inflamed. Um, there's a condition called metatarsalgia, and it's often foot type related and shoe and activity related. Uh, people who are on their feet for extended hours, uh, sometimes their foot structure just puts too much pressure on these metatarsal areas and uh, they become inflamed. Uh, otherwise, uh, people with high arched feet, or particularly in the elderly, what we see is a lot of the natural fat pad in the ball of the foot tends to atrophy and thin out. So when you press across the ball of their foot, instead of feeling a cushy uh, feeling there, you, all you feel is skin and bone. Those people tend to have a lot of pain in their bones because they lack padding. Because they're walking on them. Yeah, they're walking basically on skin and bone. So the answer to that is usually getting them into thicker, cushier soled shoes and trying to fit them with some cushion type insoles to take the place of the fat pad that's missing. Now, Dr. Marianne Pinkston, who's in our chat room, a uh, member of the board of the uh, Global Pain Association, said when you're looking for a podiatrist, ask your family doctor, ask your PCP uh, to make a referral. Yeah, a lot of times they have uh, their list of docs that they like to refer to for any specialty uh, because they're in the area or they've worked with them in the past and they, they have a good rep uh, rapport with them. Cool. Hey, I want to thank you so much for coming on. A lot of comments about how informative this has been, how helpful this has been. So, Dr. Ogden, thank you very, very much. And if folks want to get a hold of you, are you looking for new patients? Yes, sir. Just call the number on the screen, 210-341-4183, Alamo Podiatry Associates, 210-341-4183. Dr. Ogden, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, we appreciate it. Right. Now, remember, if you want more information about the Global Pain Association, just go to globalpain.org. And if you've got a question for our program uh, next week, where our topic on March 20th at noon here on GPA Live is medical cannabis with Christina Burke of Compassionate Cultivation. Talking about weed next week on GPA Live. I'm Ron Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you to our executive producer, Gina Galaviz Eisenberg, and to all of you who have joined us on this program. We thank you, and thanks to the board of directors of Global Pain Association for making this program possible. We'll catch you next week right here on GPA Live. Have a great weekend, everybody.